This episode of Get Out of Here, the AP Travel Podcast, is sponsored by Carnival Corporation, the world's largest cruise company with 10 of the world's leading brands, including Carnival Cruise Line, Cunard, Holland America Line, Princess Cruises, and Seabourn. To learn about the world's leading cruise lines from Carnival Corporation and great vacation options, contact your travel professional or visit worldsleadingcruiselines.com. It's Get Out of Here. I'm Warren Levinson. The sudden collapse of Thomas Cook, the venerable British tour operator, scrambled the vacations and family travel plans of tens of thousands of travelers around the world, unleashing a cascade of air trips and hotel bookings that had to be rearranged or scrapped altogether. The 178-year-old company was a pioneer of the package tour, and its sudden disappearance saddled Britain's Civil Aviation Authority with more than 150,000 travelers needing an alternate way to get home, the largest peacetime repatriation in the country's history. Among those brought back were AP London correspondent Charles Della Desma and his wife, and he joins us now to tell us their story, which, like most, but by no means all, has a happy end. So, Charles Deladesma, you were in Greece on a Thomas Cook tour when the whole company collapsed suddenly. Where were you? What were you doing there? And um, how'd you get back? Yeah, well, um, we were in southern Peloponnese, my wife and I, uh, a city called Kalamata, which is one of the many um, sort of short haul, medium haul um, destinations that, that Thomas Cook um, go to. Um, we weren't actually on a Thomas Cook package. We were just, we, we were flight only. Um, and so there were fears when uh, when we when we got there, and, and we actually learned the next day that Thomas Cook had just collapsed. So Thomas Cook collapsed on the day that we we flew. We we'd known that actually it was likely to happen, but we thought we'd take the risk anyway. And the flight was 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 full, but there was an announcement actually from the um, pilot at the time saying, you know, well we we think the situation is very very worrying. We'll do our very best to get you home, and we're all worried about it too. And that then led to a round of applause from the. Uh, um, you know, from the people such as us, all the, the people on the plane, um, which was, which led to a, a tremendous atmosphere that was going out. So when we were there having our holiday, uh, we booked our own hotels. We talked to a number of people, some of which were on uh, pack, uh, package holidays, where they re- include the um, include the hotel as well. And we met a tour rep that was saying that yes, she was thinking that the Civil Aviation Authority in Britain were going to get. All, all the flights back where there were concerns about the people that were actually on the packages and there was a fear that came up in the media that actually the hotels weren't honouring these people so what were they going to do some might have actually not left on their, on their flights, you know the ones are after the Sunday which we went which was the um, the, the 22nd of, of October. Actually September 22nd um, Some would have had to find accommodation somewhere else, some would have come back earlier. Now our, our problem was only that we had to keep on what Watching the CAA website um, coming out of Britain to see when our return flight actually was going to go. <laughs> and we'd heard one flight um, was supposed to go back to Gatwick in, in London, actually went to Birmingham instead. And so you'd have then had to have found your way back from Birmingham to London very, very late at night. Another occasion we heard was that um, the... the um, the travellers got to the airport in Kalimata uh, and all queued up to actually leave on these charter flights because the CAA was providing charter flights with absolutely no Thomas Cook flights were flying um, after that, um, you know, after the Monday after we, we flew on Sunday. And so we heard that 130 people were, were, were queuing to get on those flights just didn't get on them. There wasn't room. We never learned why there was so many more people wanting to go. Because clearly, you know, if they were full to start with, they should be full on their way back, uh, unless the actual carriers, uh, the, the actual um, you know, new planes were smaller. It all seemed a terrible mess. But that was the week before us. So when we actually got there um, on the 6th of October, uh, there was a heck of a long queue, but it worked fine. And so we got onto our flight, and this was sort of a bit of a joke uh, our flight actually uh, arrived on time <laughs> the joke being that most times flights don't arrive on time so all in all it was <laughs> so it, all of a sudden yes so all in all it was it was it was a happy ending but lots of worry at the time but I stress we weren't the ones that really suffered we weren't some of the thousands of people that didn't get their full holiday in the hotels of their choosing but um, in the time that you were uh, that you were there was, was this a sort of thing that sort of hung over your vacation um, that you have to um, every day check the website every day worry about 
well, is the flight actually going to, are we going to get a flight that actually takes us back? Uh, yes, it did. It did. It did. It did worry about that. It, well, of course, it meant that we we were, we took the computer and and the, and of course the the cell phones as well to make sure we had we had access. I think in our case it was easier because we were staying in 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 hotels that were you know easy to go online in the hotels. If we'd been on some you know excursion trek, uh, walking holiday, it might have been very very difficult. And of course. If you've got an awful lot of kids with you and, and you need to have everything very well organised, I think the problems um, w- were there. But yes, I mean, th- there seemed to be a long, a long delay in getting the information out on the return flights. And of course, you only had to look at the British press at the time, uh, which in our case was online, which obviously we couldn't get the papers in this fairly isolated small town we were in southern Greece. Um, and then there were all these horror stories of, of people you know, not being able to get back for the, for the, for the family weddings. Uh, there was one astonishing story of, of a couple that were actually separated. One, one um, the, 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 the lady actually got back to a, a, an important family affair and the, the husband uh, couldn't get back at all. And, and it took him something like f- five flights, four or five flights to get back. And this was just Europe. Europe internal. It's not coming back from Thailand or from or from the US or somewhere. So there was all these horror stories, but the general feeling was I think I think the figure that that was used was ninety four percent of of the flights uh, the, the the travelers got back successfully, which of course is a high figure. But when you think of one hundred and fifty five thousand people being stranded, well then you can see that that leads a fair few thousand of people having problems. Well, that's 9,000 people who don't get where they're going on time. Absolutely. You know, yes, it's 6% yes, well, mostly of, of 155,000 people. Very true. And essentially not getting back from, 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 from where they were. Um, the, the problem about going out was, was, was simply that after um, the, the, day, uh, the, the day that the, the company collapsed, there were no Thomas Cook flights going out at all. The CAA weren't offering any or weren't able to offer any... any um, uh, additional flights for the people going out, that was the end of their holiday. If they really wanted to... to, to well, they wouldn't have gone at all, because remember, it was quite possible that the hotels or campsites or whatever wouldn't be honouring the, the arrangement anyway. So we were on the last day going out. The, the issue was getting back us anyone that went on that final day and all the people that have already been out because some of these Thomas Cook uh, trips are three or four weeks so they've actually been out quite a long time a lot of people are on one weekers a lot of people are, like us were on two weekers and I can't tell you the figure of the proportion between the people that are just on the flight only and the people on the packages where as I say the problems were occurring but the overall feeling from, from all the travellers I talked to over the two weeks we were there was sadness sadness that this incredible company that's, that's so long has been going for so long has had such an impact on the travel trade couldn't be rescued at the last minute or had been in the hands potentially of 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 uh, of big finance um which wasn't able to wrap a deal at this point round it i mean there was one interesting um uh, um illustration in one of the many web stories where two of the previous CEOs were, were, were reporting to a committee and one said, oh, it, it wasn't because of the large debts that the company was saddled with. Uh, it wasn't that because we were, we were doing good work, we were reinvesting. And, and another equally important uh, former CEO says, yes, it was because of the debt. So that kind of issue, that kind of very basic disagreement would, would, would have to be you know, ironed out and sorted out in a much larger report and much more investigation. But it shows the, the swamp and the confusion that, that, that surrounded the whole issue of this massive and, and iconic company collapsing. Yeah, I can. I mean, I can just imagine. I'm uh, just from a you know a local point of view. I mean, my own son um, booked a flight to Germany on one of these small discount airlines and, uh, and arrived at the uh, at the airport only to discover that the airline itself had collapsed a couple of weeks earlier and his ticket was worthless. But, but this seems like so much larger an issue. So many more people involved. Uh- Absolutely, absolutely. Whether you're using a a very major brand such as Thomas Cook or one of these very small um, independent, um, seemingly independent um, carriers, uh, which can just come and go um, uh, per week. it's, it's of course, it's, it, it is absolutely astonishing. I mean, I, I go, I go back so far that, was, that there were the, the, the days when uh, Laker Airlines, where you were able to basically go to the airport and queue, you could queue for your flight. So you, you might have put a deposit down, uh, but you, uh, you would really wait to see where you got on it. It was the sort of thing that backpackers did more than, more than anything else. And now we've swapped that for this sort of digital domain where you can just go on and look and see. It's astonishing, you know, like a hundred dollars return to, to, you know, to get to Greece or, or um, you know. 
you know, or to, or to get to Serbia or somewhere, and then just, oh, I better get that. That's a tremendous price. And then, of course, find, ah, hmm, the small print, or, uh, oh, that's actually that's not going now. They've collapsed, uh, as, your, as your son experienced. So it is, it is a, a massive world, of course, when it works. Well, it works fantastically. Airports are a smooth, smooth running, um, uh, massive locations and very, very impressive as such. But when something gets very delayed, then you find a crush, and uh, the crush can go on for a very, very long time. So many people trying to get on these flights. And I remember the days of People Express in the United States where it was said, it never happened to me, but it was said people would go to the airport on a Friday afternoon not having any particular destination in mind, just looking to see, okay, where are they flying to that's cheap? Oh, Kansas City? Oh, Omaha? Oh, well, let's try that. We've never been there. Why not? (laughs) Yes. <laughs> uh, but I don't think it's it's but well, it is an incredible way of traveling. I mean, I think I think it's traditionally happens more in, possibly in train stations or, or, or bus stations. when You sort of go, well, I was thinking of going to the beach, but it's, it's, I think it's going to rain. So I'll tell you, what, I'll go to a city instead. You know, um, but maybe we were talking in instance was talking about slightly shorter distances and getting on this this, this, this steel bird and just going uh, thirty five thousand. Um, feet or so into the sky. It's Get Out of Here, talking with the AP's Charles Deladesma about the Thomas Cook collapse. More after a break. It's Get Out of Here. Back to our conversation with AP London correspondent Charles Deladesma. So, um, how's the trip to Kalamata, by the way? How was that? Oh, it's 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 an absolutely beautiful place. We love southern Greece, and um, funnily enough, we were thinking of going to uh, to Spain. We were all sort of down to go to Spain. Um, it's only an hour and a half, hour and three quarters to Spain, rather than rather than three hours to, to Greece from 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 Gatwick in England. Um, but we didn't, of course, go to Spain. It would have been would have been absolutely no problems at all. But as I say, we it, it turned out fine for us, and there was a slight sense of excitement about it, but worry, of course, uh, not only about the people that were suffering, um, especially, as I say, the, the families, because that's a, late September is a popular time of year for, for couples to go with small children because it's, um, you know, they, they don't go to school, the small children, so it's, um, it's, the price is a little bit lower because you haven't got that mass of, of, of school-aged children um, travelling. Um, so, but he didn't, you know, he didn't, it wasn't a problem for us really at all. So we were, we, we were close to the, the, the info to be able to find out what was going on. We knew what we were doing and we we're experienced travellers. Uh, so um, I wouldn't want to go through quite the same thing again. Um, but on the other hand, um, it, it, it worked out fine. And of course, all those wonderful things about Greece, the light, the beautiful swimming, uh, the, fabulous, the fabulous food, the walks, um, archaeological sites, absolutely incredible. One we went to where rather badly policed, I must say, you could sort of walk into this, you know, 3000 year old archaeological site and sort of pretty much walk out with a stone in your pocket. <laughs> I think a lot of people have been doing that. Which you did not, right? You did not, right? <laughs> well, absolutely, certainly not. I mean, on the beach, we might have picked up one or two, <laughs> but certainly not in the archaeological <laughs> site. No, no, we just only have great respect for the fact that these tremendous treasures from um, from these Myc- uh, Mycenaean civilizations and, and places have... Um, you know, are being rescued and restored and and being written up about. I mean, it's it's fantastic. It's it's, it's a fantastic culture. And overall, just um, in terms of logistics and the whole Thomas Cook thing, your dates remained the same. You got out, obviously, as you say, on one of the last flights before the collapse. And did you get home when you anticipated getting home, or did you have a long wait? To, no, um, no, no, uh, exactly, have no, exactly, no. Flight uh, arranged, come back. No, no. The, the the situation about going home was that once we got the CAA information over the website, that it actually was leaving exactly at the same time, which is about eight thirty on on Sunday uh, p.m. on 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 Sunday the sixth of October. We simply had to get to the airport, the same airport, which which we did um, from from Kalimata town in a, in a, a taxi we, we've been using for a couple of days, and we got there. And then, of course, there were the long queues, which we thought, oh gosh, this is going to be a bit of delay. But the queues were the ones going to Birmingham, Manchester, or not Gatwick. So then, the lady, um, a lady um, rep, which we'd seen in an earlier hotel, uh, I, I said, "Oh, what's going on? The queues seem quite big." She said, "No, no, the queues for your flight are nothing. <laughs> go that way." So it's sort of useful to have these experts at airports to tell you where to go. And so we went there, and then then we got got through the system. And then there was another long long delay. Um, you know, the Greek uh, um, Greece is very bureaucratic, so everything takes an awful long time to check up passports and stuff like that. And so then we got on to flight. The fascinating thing was that there was no insignia on the plane. We didn't know who was carrying us home. It was like a ghost flight. And, and I suppose, I mean, of course, I could have asked this, excuse me, what plane company is this and where are you all from? <laughs> and it's so much the case now when you travel around to Europe on these flights, EasyJet and Ryanair. The staff are, are, are seem to be selected from, from sort of international 
accent. You know, they all sound a little bit Finnish, a little bit German, a little bit Irish, a little bit French. It's absolutely, I, think, I think they must train them that way. It's absolutely fascinating. So everyone was wonderful. But the absolute mystery that remains with me, being a detailed person, is why was it that on our flight back, the plane was 20% full, whereas on our flight out, it was 80% full. What happened to that 60%? M- many possibilities as I raised earlier on, <laughs> that, that, that I know, it's strange. Did they vanish? Well, they obviously came back early. They wouldn't be coming back any later because it was the final day that the CAA were, were laying on these flights to get the Thomas Cook uh, uh, returnees back. So they must have come back earlier, maybe a week earlier, or they maybe organised their own flights back. So there's so many dramas attached to what happened to that 60%, which I'll never get to the bottom of. Oh yeah, that would be really yeah, that would be really interesting. It's funny about the no insignia thing, and actually the story that I have is is not it's not passenger aviation, uh, but it is also Greece. It was during the Athens Olympics. Um, uh, frequently in sports television coverage, you get um, you get blimps that fly over. Uh, in in America, most of the many of them, the ones that are most famous, are sponsored by the Goodyear company, that uh, the, the tire company, and it has its logo on the side. Um, well, the Goodyear. Uh, well, what, what happened was they weren't an Olympic sponsor, but they still wanted blimps there, and so they had just these white blimps circling around the Athens um, Olympic sites. And I'm telling you, um, after being used to advertising on the side of blimps, when you have a white blimp flying around occasionally overhead, it gives rise to the most extraordinary conspiracy theories about what must be going on about surveillance. It seems so sinister. (laughs) That by the time of the of the London Olympics, it was the same deal. The um, blimp company still didn't have Olympic sponsorship, but they were allowed to put their colors on the blimp without any writing, so that uh, to tamp down all the suspicions. <laughs> I think I think it's so easy for us for us to get. Um, Uncertain and, and, and stressed about things. We're so we, want, we need things to be in a particular order, and so and this is very very much to do with the with the airline industry. You, you need things a set pattern of things. So if you were to arrive in a sort of completely blacked out plane, where you, are you a VIP? That might be a reason reason why. So there's just this incredible uncertainty. I mean, it wouldn't it wouldn't have surprised me if during the, you know during the flight the the pilot uh, came on and said, "But by the way, I, I I know we're all going to, to Gatwick, but actually I've just now received information." that we're going to Manchester or we're going to Bristol or somewhere. And we were all gone, oh, no, because it was quite late. It was, it was getting, on, getting on now. Um, but, but on the other hand, it wouldn't surprise. There's just a sense of uncertainty. And, and, but, it, but as I say, it all went absolutely fine and we were even able to get a final train back to where we live in, in central London. And they didn't put a mask or a hood over your head, so there's really no, nothing. <laughs> that's that's there. entirely true. That kind of adventure didn't, didn't happen to us. Maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> But um, the Civil Aviation Authority basically took care of everybody. Uh, well, well every, 94% of everybody, which is when I think about that kind, of a, that kind of a situation in the United States, it would have been every man for himself. Yes, that, that, that's entirely true. But remember, everyone's, oh, well, everyone's, but each family's story is a little bit unique. Uh, it could have been that um, in individuals, uh, it was ended up being not totally inconvenient for them to find an alternative way back. But, I mean, that sounds a little hard when you buy a package holiday, when you, when you, which, of course, could be quite a lot if you've got um, 14 nights in a, quite a nice hotel. Well, then you would expect the whole thing to be laid on. You'd expect the transport. You'd expect uh, it might be full board and lodging. It might just be, you know, um, yeah, bed and breakfast, etc. But you'd expect it all to happen. So I, I think... The situation was quite smooth, and the, all the energy now, of course, in the Thomas Cook saga is, you know, the, the, the blame game, really. And, of course, all those travellers, um, especially the, the 6%, um, getting their money back, putting in applications to get their, um, um, get their money back. And I, I haven't seen any recent stories on how well that's going. It was going to be 60 days. Well, now we're, we're a month away, exactly a month away from when Thomas Cook collapsed. So clearly there's a lot more days, 30-odd days to go before people are going to learn about how their applications have, have gone. Watch this space. We'll see what happens. Charles, thank you so much. I really appreciate your sharing your experience with us. It's been fascinating. Do you have more you'd like to say? Is no, there something we've I, left I don't think so, but I suppose I'd end up one thing. I will fly again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't wait to get. I can't get. I can't wait to get in the air again. <laughs> adventures, <laughs> adventures, bring them on. <laughs>
Okay, okay, great. That's a nice attitude to have. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I've always loved travel, and actually I would have quite liked to have been a travel agent, uh, but I've written about travel. I suppose that's the line that I've gone down and, uh, you know, travelling and finding out about, you know, the, the indigenous um, indigenous populations of, of central Malaysia, stuff like that, which I, I did on, on many occasions um, for the Rough Guides. So um, that's, you know, I, I, I followed it. I went on that way. So maybe I wouldn't have been precise enough to be a travel agent. You know, I might, might get... The time's slightly wrong. <laughs> uh, which wouldn't be that. But, you know, just off a little bit. Just off a day. What is your problem? Uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I'm sure we'll get you there somehow. <laughs> I would have had, I would have had, I would, I'd have been charming about it. But on the other hand, they might not have liked it. <laughs> so I think I probably, <laughs> probably selected the right route. Charles Deladesma is a travel writer and veteran radio correspondent for the Associated Press. He spoke with us from our bureau in London. And now, my favorite trip. Mystery travel is a growing phenomenon in the travel business. One of the companies that does it, Magical Mystery Tours, books hundreds of trips a year, appealing to the busy or the travel jaded or just the spontaneous. You sign up for a trip, usually a couple of days, with no more information than a meeting place, commonly an airport, a train, or a bus depot. AP Charleston correspondent John Raby wrote about the mystery trip arranged by the West Virginia Division of Tourism this month. And we have one of the travelers on that voyage, Dina Espenscheid, a public speaker who lives in Quantico, Virginia. She joins us to tell us about that experience. How did this trip come about? Well, I saw a, a Facebook ad about um, a mystery bus trip, and you can win a seat on it. And I happened to be home that weekend and looking for something to do, so I went ahead and applied. Uh, and they just asked some basic questions like, um, are you spontaneous? Do you like the outdoors? Uh, what is your typical weekend like and what's the most spontaneous thing you've ever done? So I wrote up a little two sentence essay on some of the spontaneous things I've done and applied and I won a bus trip. So it, that's how I ended up on the bus. <laughs> and was there any uh, thought of maybe this isn't the best thing for me to be getting involved in? Um, there was probably a momentary – there was a moment where I looked and I thought, is this for real? And then I saw, you know, the, the rules and regulations were very, very legalistic, and I saw that it was linked to a marketing company uh, headquartered in West Virginia – or not West Virginia, Wisconsin. And I was fine with it. I thought this is – of course, it's legitimate. I mean, after all, nobody would ever – advertise on Facebook to try to kidnap people, right? Um, but <laughs> my, my sister immediately said, you're going to get kidnapped. We'll never see you again. Uh, and I think everyone on the bus had some story of some family member saying, you know, you're never coming back or you're about to die. Um, in, which was, you know, funny because we all kind of agreed that's why we're on the bus and they're not. <laughs> so, so how was the trip? I love the trip. It was absolutely fantastic. It was... It was completely unexpected. We um, we didn't know where we were going when we got on the bus. I had a very strong suspicion it was going to be West Virginia, just because West Virginia advertises to the the D.C., Virginia, Maryland market so heavily. And obviously they've got fall color, and it was a fall color outdoor bus trip. So where else are you going to take us for fall color? But it was great just to go on a trip where I didn't have to plan anything. I didn't have to think about anything and I didn't have to be anywhere except for when the bus was leaving be there on time or miss the bus uh-huh that's it's great to be able to hand yourself over to somebody who's gonna who's gonna treat you right yes exactly and it was a top-notch high-class trip I mean I know it's a bus trip but um we had a gourmet meal that was stupendous and beside a waterfall we went hiking and crossed a bridge. It was stuff that I would never do on my own or never get to do on my own because I'm not going to shell out like that much money for excursions. Or um, maybe I wouldn't be brave, brave enough or the people that were with me wouldn't be brave enough to go on a hike that's going to cross a bridge that was 250 feet in the air. But uh, it was just, it was fun. And, and just kind of going wherever the adventure took me was was nice for a change. And if somebody had said, okay, you know, we're going to go to West Virginia for the weekend, uh, it doesn't sound like that would have been, you know, if you know that stuff up front, that it would have been nearly as much fun. Yeah. I mean, part of the fun was what are they going to have us do next? And that was one of the questions that they asked us in the the competition section of it was, 
name your your dream weekend uh, for fall getaway. And I basically described a weekend that I had up in New England with some additions for things like zip lining. I thought for sure that they would take a zip lining somewhere or we'd we'd go bungee jumping or something like that. But the uh the crossing of the bridge was awfully darn uh exhilarating. I mean, my my legs were shaking the whole time. When I'm explaining, let me explain this bridge. It's a Vera Fer- Via Ferrata bridge, 250 feet in the air, uh, in, above a gulch between two rocks. Um, so you're walking above the, the treetop canopy, and it's like something out of um, Indiana Jones where you've got a board that's only three inches, two inches wide, and then an 18-inch gap, and then two inches wide board, 18-inch gap. Yes, you're got safety gear on you're strapped in so you know you're not going to fall but still the the mental of oh my goodness i've got to cross this thing and then come back uh and and getting over that fear of heights and the the adrenaline was just amazing wow that sounds yeah. great this sounds like so would you do another trip like this not necessarily you know leaf peeping plus but yeah. um sign up for another mystery trip absolutely as a matter of fact one of the girls that i was on the trip with uh told me about a a service called pack up and go and i've already looked into like what do they do what do they offer and how to sign up for it um i haven't signed up for one yet but that's because i've got two other personal trips planned right now that are taking up all my time and energy but i do plan on doing a, a, a mystery pack up and go experience sometime in the future That's great. Thank you so much for talking. You're welcome so much. You have a great day. And go enjoy West Virginia. It's almost like heaven. Um, (laughs) I will. I will. Dina Espenscheid told us about her mystery bus trip to West Virginia. Among the companies in the field, John Raby reports, our pink bus mystery trip based in Fargo, North Dakota. It does trips for women. Surprise me trips, pack up and go trips are also in the field. And that's the show. Get Out of Here is a production of the Associated Press, produced under the supervision of Nikesa Moody and Peter Costanzo, distributed by Westwood One. I'm Warren Levinson. We'll see you next time. This episode of Get Out of Here, the AP Travel Podcast, was sponsored by Carnival Corporation, the world's largest cruise company with 10 of the world's leading brands, including Carnival Cruise Line, Cunard, Holland America Line, Princess Cruises, and Seabourn. To learn about the world's leading cruise lines from Carnival Corporation and great vacation options, contact your travel professional or visit worldsleadingcruiselines.com.